In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The reading is from James, the second chapter. I'm just going to choose two small portions of this chapter. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And further in chapter 2, faith without works is dead. This is the word of the Lord. The irony, last night I had my computer open and I opened up Facebook. I was looking at the text and it just occurred to me that I was given the passage, do not show favoritism on the day of the Bears Packer game. I didn't have the time to weave that into the message in any creative way, but I had to mention it. <clears throat> what I do want to talk about is something, I want to approach this text a little bit differently than you might expect. So as we start here, you may not see the connection to the passage, but you will in time. For the Christian, history matters. The content of Christianity is not a series of symbols, myths, or fairy tales. It's rooted in God's actual involvement in the world, his acts in history and in our lives today. When we read in Genesis that God created, that's not just symbolic. This is a reference to God's work in the world in history. To remove God from the act of creation is to remove God from the world. And to remove God from the world is to turn him into a father who abandons his children, a sort of intergalactic deadbeat dad. And that's not the God of the scriptures. The same is true when we move forward in history and we talk about the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are not myths or fairy tales or symbols. These are claims that Jesus Christ actually came into the world, that he actually walked the earth, that he interacted with people, that he performed real miracles, that he actually died on a cross and, praise God, three days later, rose from the dead. Some people don't get this about religion. They believe that religion is the realm of feeling and opinion. You might say to them that I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and they say to you, oh, that's a nice truth. That's your truth, but I have mine. But it's okay. We can both be right. Now suppose I said to you that I have keys in my pocket right now. Would you reply to me, oh, that's nice. You have your truth and I have mine. The reality is I actually don't have my keys. I lost them, really. I just realized that. I wonder where they are. Oh no, wait. Here they are. You see, there was a fact at play here. Either I had my keys or I didn't. I didn't. It wasn't my truth or your truth. It's just truth. I had a conversation with a person recently, and it was about this. This person was concerned about all of the violence and all of the problems going on in the world today. And she was concerned that much of it came because of religious difference. And she said, why can't we just all be right? And I thought and I prayed quite a while before I responded. And I said, because for us to all be right, we would be changing the truth claims in the first place. We'd be turning claims to historical events into symbols and fairy tales and myths. And then our faith would be in vain. You see, it's interesting, um, in the, the large monotheistic religions, Jews believe that Jesus was a historical character most often. They believe he was crucified, but they don't believe that he rose from the dead. Muslims have a space for Jesus in their teaching as well. They believe that Jesus was a good prophet, but that he did not he was not crucified, nor did he rise from the dead. And yet we, as Orthodox Christians of the Scriptures, believe that Jesus actually died 
and actually rose from the dead. And this makes all of the difference. God did not just intend or think about sending his son for our sins. He actually did it. Jesus shed real blood. There were real nails. It was a real death. And praise God, it was a real bodily resurrection. Our God is a God who acts in history. So what does that have to do with our text today? Well, first of all, I have to state that this matters and this is so crucial because our sin is real. Our sin is not mythical. Death, evil, pain, and human suffering, they are real. They're not just myths. So God sent his son into a real world to address a real issue with real people. In James 2, we're taught to show favoritism, no, uh, not show favoritism, and that faith without works is dead. This isn't a passage about how we are saved when we hear faith without works is dead. The whole of Scripture makes that very clear for us. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works, so that no one should boast. Faith is a gift of God. And so, having that clear, we can take a look at these passages again. Let's look at the first part about not showing favoritism. Further in the text, it says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This example is really important for the text because it moves the teaching out of the theoretical theoretical into the practical. This is a text that tells us to not show favoritism, real actions in a real world. It's about how we actually do or do not treat people in this world. World. It's not symbolic or some sort of metaphor. It's a call for us to act in a certain way toward others. These actions are informed by an understanding that our God does not show favoritism that God acted in the world and he continues to act in the world today and he does it in a way that does not show favoritism. God is no respecter of persons. He has an equal unconditional love for each person that he has ever created. God does not look upon the rich, talented, academically gifted, the famous, prestigious, the influential with greater favor than others. God does not show favoritism. This speaks to how God conducts himself in the world and the lives of human beings. God looks at the life of an unborn child and he does not argue about the worth of that life over an independent adult. That unborn child is worth sending his son to die on the cross. And the mother who carries that child is worth exactly the same. God does not look at the poor and say that they are not worthy of his care and attention. He doesn't turn away in disgust at the sick and treat them as less than others. Jesus modeled this throughout his ministry. He spoke with, ate with, healed, and taught the rich, poor, social outcast, the person with prestige and political power. God does not show favoritism. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Job 34, yet he is not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands, his creation. Romans 2, for there is no partiality with God. Galatians 5, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. This is how God works in history. And so our Heavenly Father calls upon his children, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to conduct ourselves in a way that reflects this truth about him, a God who shows no favoritism. And while we can agree with this, left to our own vices, we would fail miserably. This is where the later statement in James 2 comes into play as well. Faith without works is dead. I know this is a passage that's often misinterpreted and misunderstood. But as I stated earlier, it's clear from the scriptures that faith is a gift of God. And in James, we're told something about that gift of God. This passage, Faith Without Works is Dead, reminds us that the gift of faith that God grants, one attribute 
of that gift is that it produces good works, actual works that impact and benefit the lives of others in the world because we have a God who is actually interested in the lives of people in this world. Think of it this way. If faith is a gift and God tells us that this gift is intended to produce good works, then a faith that doesn't produce good works is dead. It's a broken gift. God doesn't give broken gifts. Our perfect, loving, all-powerful God gives good gifts. And he calls upon us, his children, to share those gifts with the world. Amen.